Okay, today, guys, we have Alex Jimenez Grau. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the written diagram bootstrap for holographic defects. We, th we thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, please take it away. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks to you for the invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Let me know if at some point, I don't know, you don't hear well or something. Or, and of course, ask any questions like during the talk. Okay. Um, I try to keep like the slides like short. I, I don't I don't include like many technical details, but I'm happy to discuss these details if you if you are interested. So and, and again, like please ask as much as you want. If not, we are gonna finish way earlier. So um and with this, let me start. So um so I'm gonna be talking about uh some work um in progress. But this work is very much inspired um, and it's very much a follow-up of some papers we wrote. We wrote together with Julian Barrat, he's in Humboldt University and Pedro Liendo in Indesi. So let me give um, maybe some, some brief motivation. So what we wanna study is um, EDS CFT and the natural observables to consider in this context uh, or at least some of the natural observables are correlators of local operators. Okay, so, so these are a bunch of local operators. And then basically from, from this ADF-CFT correspondence, what you can imagine is like some kind of closed strings propagating in some ADS space and then scattering and then um, being measured like after the scattering. Okay, so that's the type of process that, that I'm gonna, I want to look at. But I'm not going to work in, in string theory. So instead, I'm going to be looking at the low energy description where this is described by some type to be super gravity in ADS 5 tensors. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the type of setup that, that I'm going to study. And then um, the way that one computes correlators in this setup is by using Witten diagrams. Okay, so these Witten diagrams, they are the analog of, of Feynman diagrams. Uh, but for ADS space, and they are very hard to compute in general. So even at three level, computing with diagrams can be quite complicated. Um, so that was the status for many years, but recently, um, in particular, thanks to the work of, of Leonardo Rastelli and Xin and Zhu, um, we've learned how to do these calculations in a much more efficient way. So um, the main idea is instead of trying to think of of the action of the supergravity theory after you compactify, which is an official quantity, and then trying to read off the vertices and so on and so forth. The main observation is that one should focus on on-shell quantities. So in this, quant in this, in this context, the, the on-shell quantities are the correlators, because these correlators, they are kind of scattering quantities in ADS. And the idea is that one should impose like physical requirements in these um, in these on-shell quantities, and hopefully fix the full result from this type of consistency conditions. Okay, so using this method, um, these people made um, huge progress. So in particular, they consider some four-point function of so-called chiral primary operators, and they managed to obtain it in the um, in the three-level supergravity limit in closed form. So basically, it's just um, some sum over some poles. This is in Merlin space. And these coefficients here, they are very simple. So they are just some Pohammer symbols. Um, so this in some sense is like the analog of this Park-Taylor um, amplitude in, in, in this amplitude business in, in flat space. Okay, and the fact that this result is so simple um, in the beginning, it, it led to the suspicion that maybe there's some deeper structure. And, and indeed like um, shortly after um, this amplitude was found, um, in a paper by Simon and, and Anko Yitrin, they managed to find some explanation for the simplicity of this, uh, of this amplitude. And, and it turns out to be related to some hidden 10 dimensional conformal theory. Okay. Um, and then, um, so let me just mention that after um, this type of on shell methods have been understood, now they are applied to, to many more um, setups. So, in particular, now people are able to, to compute even five point functions or they are considering setups with half maximal supersymmetry and so on. So, so really like this is technology that is advancing very fast. 
Now, what I want to do today is a slightly different. So what I want to do today is, is considering what happens when you put some brain in ABS. Okay, so, so in particular, we know, we know that brains are, are very important when, when you study string theory. They, they describe um, the effective action of open strings, and they are very important in understanding string dualities. So now what I want to do is um, I want to, like the, the, the prototypical process I'm going to look at is the scattering of some closed string, um, how it interacts with some D-brain, and then it, let, let's say like it, it emits another closed string. Right? So that, that's the type of process I have in mind. But now I'm not going to study this in flat space, but I'm going to study it again in AV. Right? So I'm going to be looking at, at this type of process, but from in a, in a low energy description in, in ABSCM. Yeah. And again, one can ask the same question. So um, to some extent, um, is this type of scattering fully fixed by symmetry? So can we determine the final answer um, without the need of knowing in detail the effective action of, of the defect and the bug? Um, is the final result simple in some way? And, and if it's simple, what's the, what's the underlying structure? Like what, what is it that is making it simple? So um, recently we were able to compute some of these correlators. Um, and, and what I'm gonna be presenting today is some kind of upgrade on the methods um, that we developed. So, so now we are able to compute these things much more efficiently. And then thanks to this um, new technology, we are able to see like this simplicity. So, so indeed we find that um, a similar notion of simplicity seems to be present even in the presence of, of, of these brains. Yeah, so that, that's the motivation for, for what I'm going to do. And maybe let me, let me give some outline. So I'm going to focus uh, for concreteness in the case of planar n equals for super young Mills. And this is going to be dual to type 2 be supergravity in ABS 5 tensors 5. Okay, so in principle, the methods that I present, they should be applicable more generally. But um, this is, at least for me, perhaps the simplest example. So um, I hope that, that it makes the discussion more clear to focus on this particular case. Uh, and then when, when I was talking about the brain, I will also call it defect most of the times. Um, it's, it means the same for me. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing in the case where this brain is actually some fundamental string. This fundamental string is attached to the boundary of ABS. Okay, and then like it's attached at some point um, and, and the locus of intersection is the position of a Maldacena Wilson loop in the conformal field. I'm gonna explain this in a bit more detail. Okay, so you can imagine that this, this brain or, or this defect, it, it forms some ABS2 subspace in this ABS5, which is the, which is the usual geometry. And what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna follow a bootstrap approach. And, and this consists on the following steps. So the first step is to make an answer for the final result. So, so instead of actually like figuring out every single factor in front of every single diagram, what we wanna do is that we wanna understand roughly um, what diagrams can appear and so on and so forth, but, but we don't care too much of what precise coefficient they have in front. Okay, so in order to make these answers, we need to find what are the um, what are the light fluctuations in ABS five and in ABS. Okay, so these light fluctuations they are some some scalar fields and and spin two fields um, <clears throat> that they they appear in in some Kaluza Klein reduction and then their interactions they are the ones that give rise to the so with the diagram that I, I want to compute later. Okay, so I will start trying to understand these effective actions in ABS five and ABS two. Next, I'm going to compute the, the building blocks that, that appear in the result. So these are the so-called written diagrams. I'm going to explain what, what are the techniques to compute these things. Uh, and then I'll try to uh, fix the answers by using the so-called superconformal word identities. Okay, so, so somehow I just need to understand roughly what, what type of diagrams can appear. I need to compute each of the diagrams. And then at the end, by imposing supersymmetry, I can fully fix the result. Now this result, it doesn't look particularly elegant, but if one goes ahead and, and does an alien transform to the result, 
um, then it turns out that, that the result becomes extremely simple and one can even guess it. So one can find a, a closed formula for, for the result. So that's that's basically what, what I want to do. But please, if you have any questions, maybe you can stop me at this point or, or later on um, during the talk. So. Do not all go ahead. Um, so let me let me explain in, in a bit more detail what's the setup. So um, on the field theory part, what we have is planar n equals for super young meals. So that this means that we are taking the large n limit, and then we are taking the Toft coupling to infinity. Okay. On the on the supergravity side, what we have is type to be supergravity compactified in ADS five times as five. Um, now, as I was saying, we are going to look at some chiral primary operators, uh, at some local operators, and these local operators, people usually call them chiral primaries. Okay, so these chiral primaries, they are, um, they are basically a product of P fundamental fields of, of, of n equals for super young meals, and then one takes the symmetric traceless uh, combination, and then one takes a trace. Okay, so this is just a local operator in an equals for super young meals. And these are famous because they, they are protected. So their, their conformal dimension doesn't receive quantum corrections uh, and they are subject to many um, non-renormalization theorems. From the supergravity point of view, um, the dual to these fields, they are um, some kaluza klein modes. And these kaluza klein modes, they are simply some scalars that live in ADS. So it's some scalars that they have some kinetic term and some mass term. And essentially this mass is related to the conformal dimension of the scalars. Now, this is the local operators I'm gonna focus on. And then I'm gonna consider, um, as I was saying, I'm gonna put some, some kind of brain or extended object or, or whatever in ADS, okay? So from the field theory point of view, this is going to be um, a Wilson loop. And it's a particular type of Wilson loop, which people sometimes call the Maldacena Wilson loop, where you couple, um, when you are integrating um, the gauge field, you also couple it to some scalar. Okay? And the reason you put here a scalar is because then this object preserves half of the supersymmetries of the original field. Okay? From, the, um, from the supergravity point of view, this Wilson loop is dual to some string which has minimal area. So you have to imagine that um, this string is going to form, is, is going to live in some ADS to submanifold. And then the action of this string is roughly um, the square root of the determinant of the induced um, metric in this ADS to submanifold. Okay, and, and we are going to compute fluctuations around this, this solution. And then finally, the, um, the observable that we want to compute um, is this two-point function of two local operators in the presence of this Wilson loop. Okay, so what this means um, from the point of view of the supergravity is that we have to compute this type of diagrams here. Now, now I'm going to explain in more detail what they mean. But essentially, when I write a diagram like this, um, the big circle is ADS5, is the boundary of ADS5 then this, this would be the interior of ADS5. Then this blue line is supposed to mean um, some ADS2 submanifold. That's where our string wall sheet lives. And then um, here, these black lines that I'm drawing, they correspond to the propagation of some kaluza klein modes in ADS5. Okay, so this would be some, some propagator of kaluza klein modes. This is a propagator, and this is a propagator of closer of like modes. And here you have interactions between different colors of like modes, and so on and so on. Okay, so, so that's the type of setup we have. Alex, is it important the, the shape of the Wilson? Um, I mean, you want it to be. It's it's nice if you, if it's um if it's a straight line because then um it preserves it really preserves like half of the supersymmetry. 
So you could also make it circular, let's say, and it would still preserve half of the supersymmetry. Uh, but in principle, I think it would be very hard to do this for, for a non-circular Wilson group. Okay. Is, if, if that's what you mean. Because then, I mean, in principle, you could still do it, but, but even then, I'm not sure it's known, like what's the, what's the minimal area string that finishes in this, in this Wilson loop. And then the width and diagrams that one has to calculate, they are very hard. But, but in principle, like, in principle, it's not necessary. It's just like a, a very simplifying. Yeah. A very any okay, questions? Okay, good. So um, let me discuss um, the low-lying fields in the supergravity action. So as I was saying, um, what we have to do is we need to take type to be supergravity. This is a 10-dimensional theory of, of supergravity. And we have to compactify it. On, on some background geometry, which is ADS5 times S5. Now, um, this ADS5 and DS5, they have the same radius. So then when you do this kaluza klein reduction, you are going to get infinitely many um, kaluza klein modes um, with certain mass. Okay? And, and you can see that these kaluza klein modes, they transform um, under, under some representations of SU4. The reason there's an SU4 here is because there's there's S5, which the symmetry group of S5 is SO6, which is um, equal to S. Okay, so, so these Kaluza Klein modes, the ones I'm going to look at, they transform in, in symmetric traceless representations of, of SO6. And then they have some, some conformal dimension and some spin. Okay, so the, the conformal dimension is essentially the conformal dimension of the operator that lives in the boundary. Okay, so, so you have to imagine that you could prepare some operator in the boundary uh, with some dimension and some spin, and then this thing is going to propagate inside the ADS4. Okay, and, and the idea is that when you look at the ADS5, really like instead of the dimension, you should look at the mass of this field. Okay, but the mass is also like it's, it's related in a very simple way to the dimension. Um, so these are the three operators I'm, I'm going to look at, and they Nicely enough, they belong to some super conformal multiple. So this was already known like long time ago in the, in the 80s. Um, if one does this compactification very carefully, uh, then one can even extract the interaction vertices of this of these Kaluza Klein modes. So in particular, um, you can have interactions between three S fields, you can have interactions between two S fields and one T, and then you can have interactions between phi and two S. So that there's many more vertices, but this here, they are the only ones I'm going to need. And then by, by expanding the string action, which as I said, is this thing, then you have some, here, here you have some ADS2 geometry, but then you allow small fluctuations around this ADS2 geometry. And then you can extract the linearized action around this geometry. So then what you obtain is some integral over ADS2, and then you, you obtain that you have to integrate S and T. And then you, you need to take some kind of trace over the, over the spin two operator. So again, like here, these actions, they are very much schematical. So in front of each of these vertices, there's some complicated number that you need to determine in a complicated way. Okay? And, and similarly, here. so these numbers, they are known, but, but it's not completely obvious how to extract them. It's a complicated calculation. And then um, besides this, this action, we have another one, which is in ADS2. Okay, so as I was saying, we have some minimal area string that forms some ADS2 inside our, our bulk geometry. And then the picture that you should have in mind is that in the boundary, so as I was saying, so this blue line is supposed to represent the ADS2. Okay, so at the boundary of ADS2, you would prepare like some, I don't know, some, some field theory operator, and then this thing can propagate in, inside this ADS2 submarine. Okay, so so from, the, uh, from the gauge theory point of view, this operator is going to have some dimension and some other quantum number that we call S. Um, <clears throat> and then from the, from the gravity point of view, 
when these things are, they are small fluctuations in the geometry of the of the string walls. So essentially, you you can put your your ADS two somewhere in ADS five, but then you can either move it in the in the directions orthogonal to the to the string, and this would be this fluctuation to xi, or you can it also has like some direction in S five, and you can also consider fluctuations in the direction in S five. Okay, and and again, now you simply expand the string action, and what you obtain is some some quadratic action for the for these fluctuations. And by using the um, this standard relation between the mass and the dimension, you can find out like what's the dimension of the dual operators to these things. So in particular, you have what people usually call a displacement operator xi, which has dimension two. And and it has some spin one, it is this index I here, and the rotations around the view. And on the other hand, you have another operator, this YA, um, which has dimension one, and it transforms as a vector under the, um, under rotations in this sphere, this S by sphere. Um, and now that you have these fields, you have some bulk to defect coupling. So in particular, this field S that I was describing before, it's going to couple to the to these defect fluctuations. Okay, so let me let me quickly summarize what I've been saying. So essentially, all the interactions that I have to care about, they have the following form. So in the bulk of ABS five, I have three point vertices between S and some other fields. And in ABS two. I can either have this type of one-point couplings, which essentially just eat up um, a bulk field. So, so the string eats a bulk field. And here, it's some interactions where the string excites some fluctuation on top of, um, sorry, so the, the, the local operator excites some fluctuation on top of the string. So now using this type of uh, vertices, I can start writing uh, with and diagrams. So the leading width and diagram I can write is a width and diagram where here I have the local operators in the boundary, and then they just interact um, through ADS5, but there's no vertex and there's no interaction with the string. So this is just like some kind of um, trivial propagator. So, so it's, it's a very simple diagram. Another diagram that I could write is one where I put some local operator in the boundary, and each of these local operators, it gets absorbed by the string wash. Okay, and, and this diagram, it appears at order lambda over n squared. Um, and finally, um, if I look one, one order more in perturbation theory, what I would call three level order, what I get is, is this type of diagrams. So here I start with some local operator in the boundary. They interact through the bulk in a three point vertex. Then you exchange some operators here in this line, and then these operators, they get absorbed by the string. Okay, so that's the first type of diagram I would like to compute. And then the other type of diagram is one where this local operator creates an excitation on top of the Wilson, um, in, in top, in, on top of the string, this excitation propagates, and like it, it kind of emits um, another local operator that ends up here. That's kind of the picture to have in mind. Okay. And finally, there's some contact diagrams. And these contact diagrams, you can think of them as, um, as coming from our ignorance on, on these precise vertices here. So by doing some integration by parts in, in these couplings, here there's always derivatives that I'm not writing. So then depending on where you put the derivatives, um, every time you do integration by parts, in principle, you generate contact terms. So, so essentially, that's going to be our answers for our bootstrap calculation. So, so what would come next, um, which is this position space bootstrap, is to compute these diagrams and fix the relative coefficients using uh, the work I did. So, so maybe here, if, if you have questions, it's a good place to ask. Um, if not, I will. If I'm if I'm losing you guys, if it's like um, super abstract, like very strange stuff, like also let me know. Like I can, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to to explain things in more detail. Or... No, I guess it's good. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. So let's, um, as I was saying, so let's compute the diagrams. 
So um, let me introduce some notation. So when I consider some point that lives in ABS5, I'm going to call it Z. When I consider some point that lives in ABS2, I'm going to call it Z hat. And then when I consider some point in the boundary of ABS, I'm going to call it X. Okay. So then the usual building blocks for written diagrams, they are the bulk to boundary and bulk to bulk propagators. So in particular, um, in a bulk to boundary propagator, you have some point in the boundary of ABS and some point in the bulk. And then it's, it's just a very simple function of, of Z and X. On the other hand, the bulk to bulk propagator is some, some hypergeometric function. And U here is some, some combination of, of Z1 and Z2. Now, when we compute these written diagrams, um, so, so we want to compute this correlator, and, and we are going to expand this correlator in Witten diagrams. When we compute each of, each of the Witten diagrams, we are going to get some integrals that, that preserve conformal invariance. Okay. So because they preserve conformal invariance, we will always be able to strip out some dimension pool factor outside of the, um, let's say, outside of the result. And then what is left, it depends on two conformal cross ratios. Okay. So in principle, everything we compute is going to depend on two variables. I'm, I'm going to call them R and W. Uh, there's some explicit formula for, for these for these cross ratios, but it's not terribly important. What, what really matters is that there's two of them and that they are the analogs of Z and Z bar. When one considers four point functions, um, usually one would call this Z and Z bar. So with, with these preliminaries, let me go ahead and compute the simplest diagram. So the simplest diagram is, is what I call a contact diagram. I'm going to use this notation where the contact diagram is called C delta 1 delta 2. And in this diagram, you have some operator in the boundary at position x1, and it has dimension delta 1. So here you have some field with dimension delta 1. And then it gets absorbed in the, in the, in the string wall sheet. And then here you have another operator with dimension delta 2 at position x2 and then it gets absorbed at the same point. And now what you have to do is you have to integrate over Z hat. Okay, so, and Z hat lives in this ABS2 submanifold. Um, so basically to translate this picture into equations, what you have to do is you have to integrate over ABS2, a product of two bulk to boundary propagators. Okay, so let me just remind you that a bulk to boundary propagator it's just this function. Mm -hmm. So you multiply two of them and you integrate over, over, um, over the interaction point. Okay, so this turns out to be a, um, a rather simple integral. Okay, so it's, it's been computed in the literature, first by, by Rastelli and Chu, but also by, by Vasco and um, Yorgos, I think he's called. Um, and the, the final result is just some hypergeometric function. Okay? And out of the two cross ratios that it could depend on, it actually depends on the old one. It only depends on that. Um, now, uh, this, this hypergeometric function, for the cases of interest for us, we are going to evaluate it at integer values of delta. Okay? So for integer values of delta, this turns out to always be um, a logarithm of R and some rational functions of R. So it's never more complicated than this. Okay, and this has to be contrasted to four-point functions. So in the, in the context of four-point functions, these people usually would call it D function. So it would be D delta one, delta two, delta three, delta four. Um, and they are also well understood, but in that case, they always depend on dilogarithms. Okay, so they depend on logarithms, dilogarithms, uh, and they depend on the two cross ratios. So, so they are much more complicated functions. Um, so these, these contact diagrams, they are going to be important because they are going to be the building blocks for our result. So, so the next diagrams we want to compute are what I call bulk exchange diagrams. Um, and in these diagrams, what you have is that you have some operator in the boundary of ABS, another operator in the boundary of ABS. They interact with the three-point vertex with some other field, and then this field um, gets absorbed eventually in, the, in, this, in this brain, in this defect. Now, this operator here, it can either have, in my example, it can only have 
spin zero or spin two. But presumably in other examples, it could even have like higher spin. So, so in principle, this is a diagram that it's interesting to compute for any spin and any belt. Um, here, this calculation in general would be very hard, but um, in this nice paper from the 90s, they found a, a very nice trick, which, which is some kind of star triangle relation. So essentially here you have some, um, some star, if you will, and then you're gonna replace this by some triangle. Um, and the catch is that this doesn't always work. So this only works for certain combinations of the dimensions of the external operators and certain combinations of the exchange operators. Okay, so, but it turns out that for ADS5, it always works. So, so for other setups, it could not, it might not work, but for ADS5, it always works. Um, so that's, that's very good. Um, and now after you use this type of star, star triangle relation, you're just left with a contact diagram and that's easy to evaluate. I just showed you the, the closed format. So in particular, for instance, an exchange, um, an exchange diagram where you are exchanging a scalar, it's just gonna be some, some finite sum from one to some number uh, over some pohammers and then some contact diagrams. Okay, so even though this integral in principle would be very hard, by using this trig, you reduce it to a sum over things you already understand. Um, for j equals two, you can play the same game. Uh, it's just a lot harder, but um, there's in principle nothing um, like nothing that stops you from from doing the same, and and eventually you manage to to also reduce it to some sum over contact diagrams. Um, now, if one wanted to do this in complete generality, like for for any spin and any dimension. Here, the, the way to go is to, to consider this split representation of the bulk to bulk propagator. So essentially the trick is to rewrite this as some bulk to boundary and another bulk to boundary propagator. And then the only problem is that then you need to integrate over the boundary part. And then you also have some extra integrals, what's, what's called um, a spectral integral, let's see. Okay, but, in principle, um, this can also be done, and, and it can also be done for higher speeds. So this, this, con this concludes the, um, the calculation of these bulk exchange diagrams. And now uh, let me discuss the defect exchange diagrams. So, so these ones, again, like in, in principle, the way to calculate them is very similar. So now in this case, what you have is, um, so, so here you have a bulk to boundary propagator. Here you have a bulk to boundary propagator. And now here you have a, a defect to defect propagator. Okay, so this defect to defect propagator is essentially the same that I already showed you before. It's essentially, it's essentially this um, 2F1 with the only difference that now instead of D, um, where D here would, would be four, um, in this case, D is just gonna be one. But, but essentially the, the, the function is the, is the same. Okay, so, so in principle, one should compute this. And there's a way to, to try to decompose um, this into a sum of contact diagrams. So, so in principle, there's, there's a way that, sorry, there's a way that I'm not gonna go into um, where you try to, to write this type of expression. However, this doesn't always work. And, and in this case, actually it doesn't work in some cases that we need. So, so to, to avoid um, these problems, what we do is that we apply the equations of motion to the diagram. So essentially when you act with the equations of motion on this diagram, um, you can imagine that you're acting with the equations of motion on the propagator. And then when you act with the equations of motion on the propagator, you get a delta function. So then um, when you have this delta function here, one of the integrals trivializes. So essentially you can imagine that, let's say the Z1 integral trivializes and then you end up just getting a contact diagram. Okay. So, so what happens is that if you act with the equations of motion on this diagram, on the right-hand side, you get a contact diagram. And now on the left-hand side, you can, you can just expand this differential operator and rewrite it in terms of your cross ratios. And you just find that it's, it's some simple differential operator. 
Um, and nicely enough, for this case, it turns out that this differential operator only depends on one of the cross ratios. Okay. So, so basically what you can do is that um, you can just solve this differential equation case by case and impose some boundary condition to extract the final result. <coughs> Alex, can you give an example of why sometimes you don't you cannot write the, the your diagram in terms of sum of contact diagrams? I don't think so because so is it understood why why can you do it at all? So it seems to me that it's not understood why why this decomposition works at all. So but, but perhaps if you have an explanation for for why that works in in this case. Because so my understanding is that even I don't know if it's in 3D in um in 3D holography, like in ADS4 holography. If I'm not mistaken, in ADS4 holography, this type of decomposition doesn't work. Even for the bulk case. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know. I don't know if there's a deep reason for, for any of this, honestly. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, sorry, it's not a great answer, but um... no, okay, but it's okay, it's okay. You can you can continue. Yeah. Okay, good. So so after this, maybe maybe a bit boring um, kind of list of width and diagrams. Now we've computed all all the width and diagrams that we need, and now um, it's time to impose the superconformal word identities. Okay, so, so let me explain a little bit what, what these things are. Um, so in order to express them in an elegant way, uh, I introduce index-free notation. So remember, um, for now I've been very like I've been very uh, let, let's say schematical about um, indices, but maybe now I'm going to be a bit more careful. So so these operators that I'm looking at these um, chiral primary operators, they transform in a symmetric traceless representation. So when you have a symmetric traceless tensor, it's a very efficient way to study it is to, uh, to take a null vector. Okay, so we take some null vector and then we contract the, um, the field with the null vector. Okay, so, so in particular, this chiral primary operator is just the trace of, of the contraction of, of the null vector with the fundamental scalar and then we, we raise it to the power. So, so that's the type of operator we are studying. And similarly for the, um, for the defect, um, what, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna, I'm gonna consider some direction in our symmetry space. So, so essentially here, this thing has six components, but I'm imposing that, it's, um, that, that it has um, norm one. So this means that I'm, I'm choosing a point in S5. Okay, so, so this theta is parameterizing a point in DS5. Um, and that's, that, that's like um, the, the index free notation I'm going to use. And then from, from this type of index free notation, I can construct a conformal cross ratio. So, so this cross ratio here is going to be invariant and there are, sim um, and there are symmetry transformations. Okay. So in particular, when I compute the correlator of, of two operators and a defect, I can strip out some overall prefactor that depends on, on u and theta. And then whatever is left inside the correlator, it has to be a polynomial in this cross ratio sigma. Okay. So, so actually when I'm computing this, it's not really that I'm computing only one function, but I'm actually computing e functions. And then um, each of these p functions goes multiplied by some coefficient uh, by some power of sigma. Um, something that is, is very nice is that if you do like an appropriate change of coordinates, and that, that change of coordinates was found in this paper by, by Pedro and Carlo, <clears throat> essentially you, you map to some coordinates z and z bar, and then you change sigma into something that, that they call alpha then the correlator satisfies some linear differential equation, so first-order equation. So here, um, if you remember that this is a polynomial in sigma after changing to alpha, essentially what you see is that 
you are obtaining some some differential equations that relate all the different all the different powers of of sigma let's say okay so so essentially what this is telling you is that even though this is a polynomial it's not a, an arbitrary polynomial so the different coefficients in this polynomial are related to each other and this turns out to be extremely powerful so let me show you an example so if i consider operators of length two um i can do this bootstrap procedure that i showed you so first i make an answer for the correlator i look at at all possible written diagrams that can contribute and then I impose, I, I compute these diagrams in the way that I just explained. And then I impose the word identity. By playing this game, I can actually fix the correlator fully. So in this case, um, because these operators have length two, this has like um, over three different powers of sigma. And then these, these three different asymmetry channels, they take a rather simple form. So, they are just some some logs, uh, so there's some logs of R, and then there's some um, there's some rational functions of R, and then some rational functions of W. And and essentially here you can kind of see like if if you remember what I was saying, like um, as I was saying, everything gets expressed in terms of contact width and diagrams, and these contact width and diagrams they are just like this type of logs. And then um, that's that's why the result looks so similar to that work. So essentially, you have a bunch of contact with and diagrams, and the result looks like this. Now, the, um, the parts that, um, let's say, coming back to Vasco's question, the things that have to be computed using these equations of motion, they are the ones that give rise to this log of one plus r, log of one plus r. So this could never come from a contact with a diagram. So this comes actually from, from this, these diagrams that they cannot be computed mm -hmm. as a decomposition of, um, as a sum of contacts. So, and, and these things are fundamental. If you don't include these things, you cannot solve the word identity. Um, now, this type of bootstrap procedure it's actually very efficient so you can you can actually compute correlators i don't know here i set up to weight 20 but probably it's a lot more i didn't even try very hard but but the point is that it's, it's very efficient to generate lots of lots of different correlators and and basically what you can do is you can go back and then you can compare it to some calculations we did a couple of years ago with with julian and pedro and you can see that for the low-lying cases the, the the two methods agree so, so this method turns out to be a lot more efficient, but that what we were doing back in the day was also correct. So um, it was not as, um, we didn't fully understand some of the subtleties, but, but now with, with this new calculation, everything is a lot more clear. So good, as, as I said, I, I have some algorithm to generate lots of correlators, but now what one would like to see is whether there's some underlying structure, okay? So, and that's what we are going to do in Nelling space. So basically, to, to talk about Nelling space, it's, it's convenient to, instead of using this R and W cross ratios. Uh, um, just a question, uh, Alex, uh, before you go on. Uh, so in this case, you cannot solve the super of for the length. It's like in a four-point function. In the four-point function, uh, the solution of the super from or the identity is gives that the four-point function is given by uh, uh, some pre factor or some some known function times an unknown function. Yes. Right. So in this case, uh, it's not possible to do the thing. So here, I guess let me go back here. So here in this case, um, probably you are familiar with some paper by I guess it's all, maybe Dola and Osborne. I don't remember who is in there. Uh, Sokachev and someone else. Um, and they study this type of um, super conformal word identities. And basically what they find is that they define them in terms of some parameter that they call epsilon. And when epsilon is an integer, you can solve the word identities explicitly. So you can do what, what well, you and your friends and everyone else is doing, which is to find some, some exact solution to the word identity. But here, um, since this is this this parameter epsilon is one half, 
yeah. in the language of that paper, what you have is that the different asymmetric channels, they are related by some um, fractional power of a differential operator. So they, they introduce some differential operator and you need to raise it to some fractional power. Um, and I don't know, we've been playing with it. And, and what we observed is that these correlators, that they look very simple when you look at them channel by channel. If you try to apply this fractional differential operator and you try to see what the reduced correlator looks like, it actually looks a lot harder. So, so these things that are nice logs, they become, I don't know, insane elliptic functions and whatever. I, I don't know, we, we couldn't even resum these things. So it, it, it was looking very hard. So is, is, does, does, does this answer your question? Or? Yeah, 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 it does. Perfect. Good, so, so that, that explains why we work like um, in terms of the different channels instead of only using um, the reduced curve. Um, in any case, so now that we have, um, we, we, we are able to generate like tons of solutions, we, we look for some underlying structure, and to do it, we go to Melin space. So, so in Melin space, as, as Vashko told us, what we should do is we should consider the cross ratios chi and eta. They are just like a simple combination of R's and W's. And then we should just use like the, um, the usual Melin transform, right? So, so the Melin transform is is taking some variable to a certain power and then integrating along the imaginary axis. So in this case, we have two cross ratios, so we need to take two million transforms. Okay, so, so what we are doing is that instead of having this position space cross ratios um, here, we end up getting some million variables that I'm calling delta. Um, now, sigma doesn't change at all, right? So as I was saying before, sigma, um, it's just like, um, so, so everything is a polynomial in sigma. So in particular, after doing the Melin transform, everything is still polynomial in sigma. Now, why would we do this, right? Like this looks like a, like a stupid thing to do. It actually is not because um, when you apply this Melin transform to a contact width and diagram, what you observe is, is that this width and diagram is constant. And when you apply it to, to an exchange width and diagram, at least in the case I'm studying, you also see that this width and diagram is rational. Um, so what this means is that we went from, from having these complicated expressions that depend on the cross ratios. Um, we, we managed to, to get something that only depends like in a rational way in delta. Okay? Here there's an important caveat. And the important caveat is like this exchange um, diagrams on, on the defect. So these exchange diagrams on the defect, as I said before, some of them, they cannot be expressed as sum of contact diagrams. And what this means is that actually this thing is gonna be a, meta a metamorphic function of the million variables, but is not rational or not necessarily rational. Okay, so, so essentially what I'm saying is that this correlator here, it's gonna have some nice part that is rational in delta and rho and some complicated part that is some, some metamorphic function of delta. So let me let me show you this decomposition. So we take the Melin amplitude, and roughly speaking, we take um, the sum over exchange with the diagrams in the back, and we, we add some contact term, and we take the sum over defect um, exchanges, and we add some contact term. And if you do this, like if, if, if you choose the, the way to separate these things correctly, it turns out that the bulk part is very simple. So essentially the Melin amplitude of the bulk part, um, it's just like some, again, like the, there's some sigma squared, which appears here. I have no idea why. And then you have a sum over powers of sigma. And here you have some, some rational functions, extremely simple rational functions. So you have some poles in delta, and each of these poles corresponds to the exchange of one single trace operator. And then you have these residues here, which are very simple. So they are just linear in row. And if you, if you generate enough um, correlators, you can actually guess the closed formula for this expression. So, so these coefficients A, they are just some pohammers, and the coefficients V, they are slightly more complicated, but, but not too much. Like it's just like some, some polynomials in P. Um, so just maybe to recap a little bit, remember, so we are computing 
correlation functions of local operator, local operator, and a Wilson loop. And we do this for local operators of different length. So here I'm considering equal length, so P and P. But what I'm saying is that there's an analytic formula as a function of P um, for this correlate. Okay. And then um, this is for one part of, of the correlator. Then for the, for the other part, what I'm calling M defect, this is going to be a sum of two diagrams. One of the diagrams is the exchange of a dimension one operator. And the other is the, the exchange of a dimension two operator. So this is what I call the tilt operator sometime before. And this is what I call the displacement operator some time ago. And for each of them, we can actually find a closed form expression for the Mellin amplitude. It turns out to just be like some 3 f 2 um, And here, there's some dependency on delta and rho. Okay, so for certain combinations of, of delta hat and delta 1, this reduces to a um, rational function. But in general, this is not always the case. So, so in general, there's always some part of the correlator, which, as I said, is meromorphic, but not, not rational. So that concludes um, the, the, main, the, the main results of the, of the talk. So maybe let me give some outlook, um, what, what one could do in the future. So to summarize, we considered um, um, like correlators of, of local operators and, and a defect. And actually, we managed to find some closed formula. What, what I showed was for equal piece, but, but this type of formula exists in, in general. So we managed to obtain a closed formula for this type of correlators in a certain supergravity limit at, at the leading non-trivial order in this supergravity limit. Okay. Now, the result was actually remarkably simple. So if, if one tells you that this result is going to be this simple, like to be honest, there's no reason to expect that. So it's a bit unclear why, why this would be the case. And, and if you look at the intermediate steps, like it's, it's actually like a very non-trivial cancellation of, of many terms that, that leads to such a simple result. So in principle, one could try to think if, if there's some explanation for why the result is so simple. So, so let, me, let me summarize a little bit um, what happened for the case of four-point functions. For the case of four-point functions with no defects, what happened is that the, this simplicity, it came from some hidden conformal symmetry that lived in 10 dimensions. Or, or actually, it depends on the setup, it lives in other number of dimensions. But, but basically, there's some hidden conformal symmetry. And the way you observe this symmetry is that instead of considering distances in usual space, you consider combinations of distances in the usual space and in some sphere. Okay, so, so essentially, this is a coordinate that lives in ABS, but Y is a coordinate that lives in a sphere. Okay, so, so usually you have some, in my case, it was ABS 5 times S5. So you form this combination and you can think of this as a 10 dimensional distance. Now, the next step is that you take the, um, the lowest lying correlator. So it's what I call H2222. But then instead of considering it as a function of X, uh, of, of lowercase x, you take it as a function of capital X. And then you tailor expand in terms of these are symmetric frustrations. So basically by doing this tailor expansion, what you observe is that you are generating all these other correlators. So, so like essentially like the correlator for arbitrary weights is just like a tailor expansion of, of the um, lowest line correlator um, when using this combination. Okay, so that's that's the way this kind of ten-dimensional symmetry is acting. I think I think it's fair to say that this is it's still not very clear why why there is this ten-dimensional symmetry, um, but it seems to be related to the fact that um, the geometry is conformally flat. So so usually here you have some ADS and some sphere that they have the same radius. So it means that you can do some conformal transformation to flat space. And then presumably this, to some extent, explains this conformal state. Now, in our case, it's not clear that such an explanation would work. So first of all, we have this ADS 5 times S5, which is conformally flat. But then we have some, some geometry, like this string geometry, which is not really conformally flat. So, 
So it's a bit unclear what, what, what this story would mean in, in this setup. Also, our result is, is simple, but it's not as simple as this for point function because we had these non-rational terms. So we had this, we had this um, three F2s here that, that are not as simple as, as the rest of the core layers. So I don't know, it would be nice if, if one can uncover some, some nice structure behind this result, but I have no idea how to do it at the moment. Um, so that's, that's of course, one, one of the most pressing questions. Um, something that maybe would help in understanding um, what's going on is to, to look at similar examples. So, so for instance, if, if, we, if we stay within this realm of n equals four super young meals, um, there's many other types of defects that one can consider. For instance, one can consider toothed lines, one can consider um, Maldacena wheels on lines, but in other representations, so for instance, in representations that are not the fundamental representation, there's also like two different types of surface defects, or there's also like um, super conformal boundary conditions, studied by Gayoton Witten. So in principle, this type of bootstrap should also work for, for all these defects. And perhaps if we understood, like if, if there's similar simplicity in these other setups, perhaps that gives a hint of why, um, like, like what, what is this coming from? Or like what's, what's the underlying mechanism behind this? Um, now, uh, besides n equals for super young meals, one can consider other holographic setups. For instance, the 16 to 0.0 theory um, has some ABS7 description. And then you can, you can intersect this ABS7 with some M2 grain. And yeah, sometime after our paper with our papers with Julien and Pedro came out, there was a nice paper by, by Menegeli and, and Trepanier, inspired by our work, where, where they managed to do similar type of bootstrap to work with it. So, so in principle, like everything I showed today, it should be applicable also to this setup. It would be nice to see if there's a similar simplicity of the result. And of course, same story for 3D theories and, and whatnot. Okay, and of course, this is just like getting lots of different examples. So this doesn't seem like very interesting, but what would be great if, is if one finds like some underlying um, physics, right? Like for instance, um, in some nice paper by, by Fernando and Shinan, they managed to find some, some correlator that interpolates between three-dimensional ABJM theory um, four dimensional n equals for super young meals and, and 6d2, 0. And they have some, some continuous parameter that allows them to interpolate between these correlators. So, so it would be great if something similar to this also happens in, in our setup. Uh, and finally, the last application of, of these results um, is, is from the usual study of, of conformal bootstrap, let's say. So once you have a correlator, this correlator allows you to extract CFT data that you didn't know a priori. So, so in this case, um, we have two different OPs that one can do. So you can either multiply the, the two chiral primary operators and expand them as a sum over local operators. Or, um, and, and then like, this is what I'm representing here pictorically. Or you can take a, a local operator and expand it as a sum of defect operators. And, and this is what I'm representing here, Victor. So essentially, like these correlators that, that we've been computing, they contain some infinite amount of CFT data. And it would be interesting to, to try to extract this data. And again, like um, <clears throat> this is a non-trivial task. So one has to take into account some super conformal blocks. And <clears throat> there's, there's going to be like some mixing problems. But if one manages to solve these mixing problems, in principle, the CFT data that you extract, um, it would provide, let's say, a target for people working in integrability. So, so presumably, these type of setups, they might admit some integrability description. So, so in this integrability description, you can either do, let's say, a weak coupling calculations, and now we have strong coupling calculations. It would be great if someone finds some integrability description that can do this type of calculations at fine. Um, and yeah, that's basically everything I wanted to say. So thank you very much for, for your questions and your attention. And yeah, please ask more if you, if you want. Okay, guys, let's thank Alex for the very nice talk and for the perfect respect for time.
And now we have time for a few more questions. Uh, yeah, uh, hang on. So you said that the. Uh, uh, so, sorry, first, can, can you hear me from here? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Okay, nice. So you mentioned that you were doing some stuff for a uh, large company. So uh, where did that come, come into play? Exactly. Yeah, so so this is yeah, that's a good question. So this is implicit here when I'm making the answer. So um so so this 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 has to do with like this answer. So if you first like at we coupling, I'm not even sure if we expect this ABS CFD correspondence to, to make much sense, or or even if it makes sense, the description shouldn't be in terms of supergravity. So so that's that's one point. And the other is that um, if you go to higher orders in lambda, then here you are going to need to write more diagrams. So here, for instance, I'm not considering a loop, um, some some loop that is formed inside the defect. For instance. So that, that's a, a diagram that in principle would exist, but it would be subleading in lambda. So, so essentially, I'm. I'm making this strong coupling assumption to be able to write only these diagrams. If I want to go to the next order at week uh, at strong coupling, I need to include more diagrams. Okay. Okay, I see. Thanks. Other question? So Pedro and Francis Papilla have this paper where they have uh generalized melanopsis that uh, incorporates the uh, asymmetry parts. I guess they, they managed to find some simple melanopsis that, uh, well, some simple melanopsis for all the four point functions of uh, any, well, any asymmetry weight. Did, did you try to do that in your setting? What what paper are you talking about? Can you can you repeat? Uh yeah, it's some paper from two two or three years ago by uh, Pedro Vieira and uh, Francis Papillon. Uh -huh. No, I, I, I'm not I'm not familiar with it. So it's it's a different idea than this ten dimensional conformal symmetry. Uh, it's, it's, it, it goes along the same lines. Uh, they try to make the uh, this idea of uh, even symmetry more manifest at the, uh, at the level of the phenomenon. I see. Yeah, I should, I, I, I should look into that. that. That sounds, yeah, I, I haven't looked into that. So so that sounds like a good idea. Are there any localization results for uh, this uh, setting? Yeah, so actually there are. So, um, Essentially here, um, when I'm writing this word identity, actually what this means is, is the following. So this is just like a fancy way to say that um, when you take f, oh, I'm so bad at writing like this. So when you take f of z, z bar, and, and z, this should be constant. So essentially what you are doing here is that um, there's some there's some localization sector that captures this limit, and then this is described by some topological to the Young Mills theory. So um, these are some papers by um, Giambi and Pestun, and what this means is that in this limit um, you can compute everything by weak contractions because the, um, the after localization the action that is left is is just um, it's just a Gaussian action. Um, this is useful. I mean, this allows you to fix some um, some of the safe CFT data. So, for instance, you can fix this coefficient a here for the single trace operators, and that that is nice because um, actually our bootstrap result, um, in some sense, like our conditions, they are homogeneous. Like they cannot determine the overall scale of the result. So in principle, in order to, to write some results that, that actually depends on the coupling, I need to go and compare to localization. So, oh, yeah. so I wouldn't be able to fix the full correlator 
like the so here when I'm writing this result um, that actually depends on the coupling. Here I actually did the exercise of going to localization and comparing. And, and this is also nice because you only need to fix an overall coefficient, but you can actually compare many more. So, so in principle, um, localization by like um, this method makes many predictions that you can then compare and agree with localization. So, so yeah, this is something we did in detail in, in our earlier papers. Now I haven't really looked at it, but, but presumably it should be the same. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, have you thought about considering more operations? About what? Considering more operations? No, not really. I mean, I. Honestly, so far the only thing I've thought about is um is this um it's these boundaries in n equals four um yeah and, and I think Vasco told me that that you guys were trying at some point and, and you didn't succeed and I don't know if I'm gonna have the same problems that you guys did so but but besides that I haven't really tried anything else um. Yeah, like I, I think the natural thing to do is like this should be very easy to do. Yeah. Um, and it would be nice to see if, if at least like I don't know, there's a similar structure, whether this is still is like these three F twos are still there or not, because I am really confused like how much of this is is fundamentally like let's say important or, or how much of it is, I don't know. It's like a coincidence. I, I don't know. I'm I'm a bit confused in general. But but yeah, looking at more operators, it would be interesting for sure. I, I think something like bug bug defect. I don't know if it's very hard, but something like bug bug defect maybe, um, or bug defect defect. I don't know, like so something that doesn't have too many cross ratios. Yeah, right. Really right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because also in general, so one one of the one of the nice things about these type of setups is that if you look at the diagrams, usually in a four-point function here you would have two more legs, right? So this last integral in a four-point function it would also be like quite hard. So somehow from this intuitive picture, it's clear that these correlators will always be a bit simpler than four-point functions. So so to some extent, it's like a nice toy model to to play with and. Uh, maybe learn some nice tricks that one can then use in, in four point functions or, or five point functions or six point functions or whatever. So, so it's, um, it, it, I think it's a good motivation to, to look at these things. <clears throat> Other questions, comments? Okay, if not, let's thank Alesh once again. And thanks you, thanks to you for for your questions and the invitation. <laughs>